Good evening, everyone, and thank you. Welcome to our August Board of Education meeting. I would like to ask everyone to please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a very full um, agenda tonight, as is customary with our um, August uh, meeting. We have our reopening of the schools for the year plan, as well as our district goals that will be reviewed in presentations. For anyone who is planning to um, be part of our public participation, you do need to sign in with our district clerk. There are forms that are on everyone's seats. Um, if you don't have one, you can see her. And also, as a reminder, you must be a district um, resident to speak. So with that now, I would like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Manning. Thank you so much, Susie. So uh, good morning, or good evening, and welcome, everybody. Um, I just want to, on behalf of the board, just welcome everyone to tonight's meeting. Everybody who's watching at home, uh, welcome. We're excited for the start of the 21-22 school year. Uh, as many of you know, it's quickly, quickly approaching. And as you can tell by tonight's agenda, we are welcoming a lot of new staff uh, onto, uh, into, the, into the family, so to speak. And we are uh, just excited about that today. Earlier today, uh, Ms. Campbell and Dr. DiLorenzo, Ms. Donnelly, led a new teacher orientation, new staff orientation program. And it was just exciting to see everybody here today. We know that there, careers are going to be wildly productive and successful, and we're just so happy to welcome all of them. But you're going to hear more about them later, later on in the agenda. As the community is also aware, we've been actively working to coordinate all the construction projects that are occurring throughout the district. These security and facilities upgrades were approved by the community in the 2019 capital bond referendum. They will result in significant improvements on instructional program. We're really excited. You're going to hear more about that tonight in uh, Ms. Donnelly's update to the board and the community in just a little bit. Anyone who is involved in any type of construction today, whether your home or your office, understands that obtaining materials right now and, and labor is certainly difficult. So because of this, some of the projects are taking a little bit longer than anticipated, but they're gonna be, uh, and may not be fully ready for the opening of school. But I just wanna assure the community that our school buildings will be ready for our students when they arrive on September 2nd. I wanna thank Ms. Donnelly for her contribution to the capital projects and our facilities and custodial teams for their hard work to make our buildings look immaculate for the start of the school year. As you may have seen on our website, we have nine administrators that have either moved to new positions within the district or are new to the district. They've certainly jumped right in and I wanna thank our, all of our administrators along with our clerical staff for their tireless work that they do to prepare for the new school year. We would certainly be in a different place without them. So I'm very excited and happy that we were able to get ready for the first day. Also, as the community is aware, we ended the year in spectacular fashion with beautiful moving up ceremonies. And we uh, again wish to congratulate the class of 2021. It was a pleasure of mine to see the students being able to be celebrated with their families in attendance. And we remain proud of the work that we were able to accomplish over the past year. I'm excited about the future work ahead of us. While it looks like we're beginning the year with uh, COVID protocols in place, we wanna keep our learning community focused on the future and always moving forward. So you're gonna hear about the goals that the board has worked to develop. And I wanna thank and acknowledge the Board of Education for their work on this process. The community is also gonna hear about the proposed reopening operations plan for the new school year that the board will consider for ratification tonight. I believe this plan is exceptional because it provides for the full return of our students while also providing a safe environment uh, for, for everyone. Shifting gears for a moment, I wanna share with the community that I had the pleasure of attending the New York State School Boards Association Summer Law Conference with two of our board trustees, Ms. Broderick and Dr. Preet. This conference provided us with the opportunity to hear from school board association and several legal firms and the latest updates in the ever-changing landscape of education law. I also had the pleasure of attending Scopes Education Summer Conference with Ms. Broderick. And we had a uh, pleasure of hearing from Regents Tillis uh, among other speakers who spoke about some of the challenges the New York State Board of Regents is looking to tackle in the upcoming school year. Both of these uh, conferences were extremely informative for sure. So that's really it for my report. I wish to conclude my report by stating how much I'm looking forward to greeting our students on September 2nd, uh, from the senior class of 2022 to the newest members of the Harvard Fields family, the incoming, sorry, kindergarten class of 2034. We know this is gonna be a great year. 
So congratulations. Thank you so much. Now I will uh, ask Ms. Donnelly if she can help us out with this capital bond presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Just have it. All right, you can sit here. No, I'm good. Thank you. Well, that's good. So the Harbor Fields vision statement is here. And our mission statement. So I am going to mention on one slide for each of the four schools what was done already in phase one prior to the summer's work. So at Harbor Fields High School, new security hardware was added to all interior doors. Some doors were fully replaced. And of course, the turf field was installed. Over this summer, phase two work included a new security vestibule at, at the main entrance, library renovation, a select bathroom renovation, and heating and ventilation upgrades. So here you can see at the high school main entrance, the transaction window that has been installed. You, you see the hole, you see um, that the glass is actually have been covered, but there's glass that's been installed there. And of course, the finishing work is in is next to be done, which uh, will just be the last 5% of this project. Ultimately, there will be a security guard sitting on the other side of the window to accept um, and interact with the public and to accept um, whatever a parent might be dropping off. Here is the high school library. Um, we anticipate that the library, right now, it, we're anticipating 90% completion by September 1st. I just want to show you here just two days later. I don't know if you could just flip back and forth real quick between those two slides. Look at the ceiling. You can see now they're starting to, what they call, white out the ceiling, which is putting the tile in place, and the flooring is complete. So. Um, it may not look as complete as 90% by September 1st, but this is the part that will move very quickly. So just doing a little work look ahead, what remains to be done in the high school library is the ceiling and painting will be finished this week. The flooring was completed this morning. Uh, a final cleaning will take place this Saturday. And then what we're waiting on is the casework the built-in casework, which that shelving is expected to be delivered August 30th, and lo loose furniture is due to arrive in mid-September. So um, we're well underway. I, I know the picture may look 
to be contradictory to that statement, but this is all going to come together very quickly now that the framework has been laid. Then um, select staff bathrooms were renovated. So if you look to the left, you can see just one day prior what the, the staff bathroom looked like and just in one day. And I wanted to show that so you could see that yes, you know, this, this remaining work will move quickly. Even though, you know, I realize today's August 24th and it may, they may look like scary pictures. You can see how much progress is made in these last days. Uh, the high school gym is 100% air conditioned. It's, it's fully complete. And the heating ventilation upgrades at the high school, uh, we're expecting the exhaust fans to be 100% installed complete by the first week of September. And the unit heater installation in the airport wing is 100% installed right now. It's ready, it's piped in, ready to be um, run when needed. Now moving on to the middle school, uh, as a review of the phase one projects, new security hardware was added to all interior doors with select full door replacement. Phase two projects at the middle school include the following, uh, the new security vestibule here, uh, renovating the lobby area, installing an ADA compliant fire and smoke detection system, air conditioning the gymnasium, and ventilation improvements for the third floor corridors and also select classrooms, as well as the library renovation. So um, the interior vestibule storefront, which is just the second set of doors that will be installed. Right now we have the same exterior set of doors that you're all accustomed to seeing. Um, but the second set is not expected to uh, be here until mid-fall, sometime in October, um, and will be installed after it arrives. Um, but in the meantime, the entry will function just the way it has functioned with the doors still there. Uh, this is what the uh, lobby area looked like a couple of days ago. So on the next slide, you'll see that the lighting has been installed. So if you flip back and forth again, if you would, Dr. Manning, you can see the difference in the ceiling um, and how much work has been done in nearly two days. So that's why we can say it'll be 80% complete by September 1st. And the thing that makes the 20% balance is again that storefront, that second set of doors, which um, won't, be, won't be installed until October. So looking at what work lies ahead for the lobby and um, the, the entry area here. The ceiling grid tile will be finished tomorrow evening. The final cleaning will be done tomorrow in anticipation of the painting because they want all the dust to be removed so they have a nice clean area to work in to paint on this Friday. The plastic that you see blocking will be down on Friday. And as I said, that remaining 20% will just be the second set of doors. Um, here, here's a picture of just one of the pull stations for the ADA compliant fire and smoke detection system. So here again, um, we're just waiting on devices. All the wiring is done and that you know speaks back to what uh, Dr. Manning was mentioning, that we're running into some problems with materials, but still we're doing really well. And in the meantime, until this system is in place, the old one is still operational. So we're in good shape with that too. The gymnasium here at OMS is air conditioned. Uh, well, it's 80% complete at this point. And the ventilation improvements on the third floor, um, we, are, we had two exhaust fans that are being installed in the third. Uh, the third level, and that'll make a tremendous difference in ventilation and circulation up on the third floor. They'll be fully operational by September 1st, so just in time for the staff and students. Here's the library at OMS. Now, this, this job actually is only at 20%. That's because of a delay that happened with SED giving approval. I, it, there's just a long, uh, line in the queue up there and for some reason this job was one of the ones that just was delayed 
despite our architects, you know, pushing, reminding, urging. So um, the library right now is at 20% completion. So the work look ahead on this, what's the plan with that is uh, there will be a safety walkthrough corridor because as you may know, the students use that library to walk through from one side of the building to the other. So there will be a corridor that's, that's built by the contractors that will be very safe for the students and staff to walk through and work will shift tonight starting on September 1st. In the meantime, um, library services will still be delivered enthusiastically by Ms. Boschnack. Um, she'll be doing push-ins so that the students don't miss out on anything. And ultimately it'll be worth it because this will be an amazing space for them. Now moving on to TJL. Uh, the phase one project that happened there in the past was new security hardware was added to all interior doors. Uh, over this summer in phase two, the projects included renovating the library, converting classroom B1 to be a science room, air conditioning in the gym there as well, and ventilation improvements there. So here's the library. I mean, look at, look at all the contractors busily working there. Um, that's currently at 70% completion. And the work plan at TJL is that uh, carpet work started today. Flooring, ceilings, and painting will be complete by September 1st. And then we'll just be waiting once again on the built-in casework and the loose furniture, which are expected the first week of September and mid-September, respectively. This is classroom B1, which was uh, converted from a classroom to a science room. So you can see here, it's at 80%, the tile work is down, the floors are, um, the tile work is down and the walls are all in place and they're just wrapping up on the ceiling lighting. What remains to be done there is uh, the tiling work in the bathroom that's part of that room and the wall tiling. And by the end of this week, that room will be 100% complete. The gym at Leahy also is, a hun is air conditioned, 100% by mid-September. At Washington Drive, they received a security vestibule enhancement, much like what you saw at the high school where they had a transaction window installed. Over this summer, um, the, project, the projects there were carbon monoxide detection uh, installing a play area near the, right next to the existing playground in the back, exhaust system upgrades for the second floor corridors, and air conditioning the gym there as well. So the wiring is complete and ready to receive the, the carbon monoxide devices and the subsequent programming that'll take place once they're there, and those devices are expected the first week of September. Uh, here's a picture of the concrete pad that's been poured for the sports area, for the um, new sports surface that will be placed on top of that when that comes. Here you can see um, the two corridors of Washington Drive, and they're 95% complete as far as their exhaust system installation goes. The gym is also 95% complete at this point now. And we certainly are looking forward to a very terrific year. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Ms. Donnelly. That um, is an ex uh, outstanding presentation. And after talking about our capital bond for so many years, it is certainly rewarding to finally see it coming to fruition with so many great enhancements to our facilities that the students are going to enjoy this year. At this time, I'd like to ask the board if they have any um, other questions about our capital bond projects. Chris? Great. Can you just uh, maybe talk a little bit about 
the libraries and if, uh, if they're not fully operational or open on day one, just talk a little bit about deficient services and how we make up for in the library. Right, so we've, um, you know, obviously library renovation like that is a, is a very uh, intense job. So we've been planning with the principal since day one, the plan B opportunities for our staff to do push-in services. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, during COVID, a lot of push-in was provided uh, during that time. We've gotten very good at push-in services for library. Uh, so that's uh, something that, you know, I, again, I say fortunately or unfortunately, we've become very good at, the, at that. So during the time when those libraries are not yet ready, we will continue to provide library, library services for our students in that fashion. Does anyone else have any other questions or comments about the capital bond? No, okay. Here we go. So um, the, as I said earlier, the Board of Education has been working uh, throughout uh, recent months in developing the Board of Education goals for the upcoming school year. So I want to just take you through a little bit of the process. Um, as Ms. Donnelly said, you know, we have our vision and mission statement. Every year, the Board of Education strives to adopt goals before the start of the school year. And that the purpose of doing that is to provide a direction for the work throughout the year. Um, as you might be familiar, those who've been attending board meetings in the past, we have provide regular updates to the Board of Education and to the community with regard to um, progress on those goals that are developed. And along the way, we provide uh, information on programs and outcomes that substantiate that work. Along the same lines, we collect information such as student performance, uh, program effectiveness, we look at you know, in the budget, cycle we look at state aid projections and obviously that influences budget decisions are made regarding programming um, and all that information is obviously collected and provides information for future discussions around goals for the following year this past august 10th the board of education met uh, for a work session where we discussed uh, the development of the goals and further refined the goals work for the upcoming year and here we are tonight with the presentation of the final version of the, of the Board of Ed goals. So those of you familiar with the Board of ed Education goals over the last several years understands that the board has developed three pillars uh, and that those pillars serve as the framework for the development of the goals. And those are in the areas of innovation, curriculum, and finance. So where do we stand today? Obviously, you've heard me say we're very excited about the future direction of our district. We have significant facilities upgrades. You just heard some of those things that's going to lend nicely to security projects and, and instructional programs that are going on throughout the district. We have curriculum initiatives that are underway, and you're going to hear more about those things. Um, we have obviously made a lot of advancements with regard to technology over the last uh, year, and we're looking at ways we can keep that, that, way, get that going. In addition, how we're using that technology to provide a safe and secure learning environment for our students. And of course, supporting our students as we emerge from the global pandemic. Um, this is something obviously that we, we have always strived to, to take advantage of and do, and something that we're looking to continue. So in the, I'm gonna go through the, each of the pillars. I'm gonna pre present the goals, and we'll, we'll uh, go, go from there. Within the innovation pillar, uh, what we're looking to do is to drive the conversation about what is next for Harvard Fields. What's the next direction? Where are we going next? So the board is uh, looking to develop a, fi a five-year strategic plan, and that involves uh, gathering input and information from the community, from staff, uh, as we develop the plan to understand what the next five years, what the future path of the school district is. So that's something that we're really excited about, and certainly you're going to learn more about that in the coming uh, weeks and months ahead. Also in line with that, we have every year, uh, I should say every five years, we develop a technology plan. We are currently part of the technology 2.0 plan. You might've heard about it. 
Uh, and that's the plan that brought about the one-to-one -one program and all the innovation that went along with that. We're looking at the next iteration of that. What, what's next after that? As I said before, we're welcoming a kindergarten class that's gonna graduate in 2034. So what does it look like when those students walk out of our doors uh, so many years later? So we're looking to develop the next version of the, our technology plan, which we are calling our Harborfields 2030 plan. And that's, uh, that's coming up. And then of course, we're gonna seek opportunities to develop an affirming environment that meets the needs of our students, looking at our programs, our co-curricular program, our extracurricular program, and how do we meet the needs of our, of our students in, uh, in that process? In the curriculum area, uh, it's, as it says here, looking to develop the whole child, opportunities to promote character and civic awareness, foster an inclusive environment, and we want to nurture respect for differences, development of compassionate, caring, honest, and responsible school-wide community. Uh, these are things, obviously, that we're, we care passionately about, and we're looking to uh, develop our, our, our students. We'll want to ensure the effective implementation of our literacy program. We um, announced at the end of last year that we're looking to, or we are in the process of rolling out a new literacy program in reading and writing at the K to five level. And that is going to, uh, you, you want to hear more about that, but we are K to five looking at teacher's college writing and uh, K to five looking at Fonsus Pinnell reading. So you're going to hear more about that program um, in, the, in the coming weeks. And of course, supporting all students as we continue to navigate through, unfortunately, and emerge from the global pandemic, uh, looking at just again, supporting our students. Every year we develop our, what we used to call guidance plan. Now it has a much more fancy name, comprehensive developmental school counseling plan. So how do we support our students uh, through all the different programming and initiatives that we have in place in that plan? In the area of finance, obviously, the, a lot of the work we do, all of the work we do, right, depends on our financial uh, health. So we're looking to make sure that we're doing those things that we need to do to guarantee future programming. So uh, as we all do in our, even our own homes, uh, the equipment that we have, we want to see that we maintain it and are able to replace it. So we're developing a five-year plan to look at our facilities equipment and uh, the replacement plan. Again, we're looking to uh, I talk a lot about security with our enhancements with the capital bond. So we're looking to implement and support those, those enhancements uh, through the budget uh, that the community approved in the capital bond referendum. And those of you who attended the July meeting heard from our architect about an EPC, an energy performance contract that we're looking to enter into. And that is work uh, that we will be doing uh, at, at no cost. Um, through energy, the, the, the cost of it is funded through the savings uh, that are achieved by the enhancements. So we're excited about that work and you're going to hear more about that uh, certainly as we go forward, but that EPC contract will allow us to do more work for the same amount of money that was approved in the capital bond referendum. And that's certainly good news for our, for our residents and our taxpayers. And of course, um, Always, when we look at our funding, we want to make sure that our reserves are healthy uh, for the long term. And that is a, a goal of the board, plan for the continued funding and use of reserves, which align with our multi-year plan. And that is a, a synopsis of the board goals for the 21-22 school year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Manning. Um, I just wanted to say how proud I am of the work that we have done um, as the board and along with the administrative team in developing these goals. Uh, first and foremost, how exciting that we are planning for the future, that we are not just going to be um, defined by the last couple of years of COVID, but that we are going to be proactively moving forward with um, educating the students and especially about looking at the whole child and the bigger picture of students. So developing more of those creative interests, finding more opportunities potentially um, in the area of, of sports, um, finding things that just drive uh, children to find their own um, passions and that it goes beyond just the traditional, you know, reading and writing and math and social studies, which of course are very um, important foundations, 
but that we look you know, beyond that. And I also um, look forward to how you develop the plans for how we recognize our students for their own unique potential and their own benchmarks, that we don't want our children just to be numbers and test scores, but that we want to appreciate them for showing important values, um, for community service, and just being contributing members um, that we can be very proud of them when they leave um, Harbor Fields. Um, does anyone else on the board would like to uh, comment about the goals or have any questions about the goals? Yeah. I just, just a quick comment from each of you. I just thank you, Rory, for the work uh, pulling this together. I know it was a lot of work over the summer. Um, I personally really like this, this three pillar approach that we have. It just really, I think over the years, it's really helped us come up with really robust goals and it forces us to have you know, long, um, meaningful conversations in each area and develop all these goals over time. So I'm really happy with the way it came out and uh, uh, especially happy about the, the, the five year plan and coming up really starting to think long term. I know, you know, schools generally operate in sort of a year, year two out and I hope we can really push that and, and um, push Harbor Fields even higher. So, so thank you. If I could just comment, I appreciate that so much, uh, Chris, because, you know, that's obviously the work that uh, we, the board is looking to do right now. It's, it's, it's a struggle to see us, how we get through, you know, opening a school and, and all the challenges that certainly will look like we're going to be facing again, uh, but driving that conversation on how the future looks beyond that because obviously our, our most important possession are our students and we want to make sure that we're providing them with all the opportunities that they deserve uh, to be successful in, in their careers here at Harborfield. So I'm very excited about that work and I agree with you. Thank you so much for the, for the guidance uh, through this process. Doing with this mic, any good? All right. How are you, Ms. Campbell? Okay. So um, at this point, uh, we're going to transition to our next presentation. It's our final presentation. So I thank you for your patience and, and thank you for your patience with the technology. Um, what we are looking to, what we're going to go through right now are our um, reopening operations plan. You've heard from me. Uh, through both the video presentation that went out, the desk side chat where I was able to ask, answer some questions. And obviously I see a lot of faces that are familiar in this room, people I've spoken with um, throughout this process. And so I'm looking forward to um, obviously continuing to try our best to address your concerns and, and make our schools open as safely as possible uh, for everybody. As many of you know, um, and you've heard this before, um, I'm going to try to go through the plan. There have been some developments since we last spoke, uh, and that obviously is something that came out today. If you've been uh, looking at uh, New York State transition and the New York State government, uh, our new governor came out today and verbally talked about um, imposing or directing New York State Department of Health to impose uh, some, some mandates. And so obviously we have nothing in writing, we don't operate based on what happens at a, at a podium, uh, but we are certainly anticipating um, that guidance to come forward. So that is a new development. Uh, we of course expected it based on prior comments that our new governor made, but um, we'll, have to, we'll have to wait to see what happens, what happens going forward. But obviously as we always do, we'll be in close communication with our community as changes arise. But now we have, uh, we're at the August 24th Board of Education meeting and the board needs to consider the adoption of a reopening plan for the start of school so that guidance can be provided to our school principals um, and communicated to our families. So I'll go ahead. Um, again, I'm gonna go relatively quickly because I know a lot of you, and again, I, I know a lot of you <laughs> in the room because we've spoken about this. Um, know the challenges that schools have been under. You know, the, we ended the year uh, in, in a very positive note. We were all anticipating good things coming forward to the future, but obviously things have changed and shifted. Um, with regard to guidance that we were under, we were under New York State guidance at the time and New York State 
at the time issued guidance for summer programs, for example, where masks were optional indoors and uh, we went there and, uh, and then fast forward to August 4th, all of a sudden New York State says we're not providing guidance. Um, so that left schools to, to kind of shuffle a bit. Um, we all know what has happened since. CDC guidance updated their guidance the following day. South Carolina Department of Health released guidance uh, to schools. New York State Education Department released guidance to schools. Um, and then we went out and released a draft reopening operations plan based on that guidance. Since that time, of course, I held the desk side chat, but again, today, we, we are uh, left wondering what's going to happen with New York State. If you take uh, the words that we used, we are anticipating a, a mandate of some type coming out requiring masks in schools. So that's where we are today. Obviously looking forward, we have our superintendent's conference day coming up on the 1st and first day of instruction on September 2nd. So what I wanted to start out by saying is, you know, trying to stay positive, right folks? Uh, that this is not 2020. Uh, we learned a lot uh, over the past year, uh, year and a half, so to speak. And, you know, we had three primary objectives, and I think everybody can understand these objectives. We want to have all students in school, which we weren't able to do last year. We were hybrid at the 6 to 12 level for most of the year. Uh, we were able to bring every, all students back at the end of the year, thank, thankfully, uh, but we wanted that full implementation for this year. We want to keep students in school, and that means putting things in place that avoid student, students being exposed and result in quarantine that would happen. Uh, and we also wanna keep our schools open throughout the year, free from interruption, no shifting to remote, uh, no mandated closures. Those are the things that we wanna see happen. So I think everybody can agree on those goals that that's, what, that's certainly what uh, everybody would want. So when we look at our program goals, we wanted to run a full in-person in academic program including our athletic, our extracurricular, co-curricular programs to the safest extent possible. Our athletic program went through some tough times last year, shortened seasons, shifted times, no spectators. Uh, it was, it was not, a, not a great thing, but we made the best of it. Um, and again, that was mandated on us. That wasn't something that we had control over, but we, we certainly did a great job and were very successful with that. Uh, we wanna safely host in-person activities. I know last year, uh, a lot of, we couldn't attend in-person events. Uh, we're looking to host those this year. Um, and that includes spectators, clubs happening in person, extra help sessions in person, um, students at high school and all mass being able to use their lockers. These are all good things. I don't know if you saw that video I did with the high school students. That's one of the questions they had. <laughs> they wanted to know if they could use their lockers. And we're looking to utilize the cafeterias. And that's good news. I know for Washington Drive, a lot of the uh, our students there wanted to take advantage of the hot lunch offerings that we have. So we wanted to uh, make sure we're able to utilize our cafeterias. So we know that when the New York State uh, government decided to not provide guidance, they shifted schools to look at CDC guidance. Now I will say that that looks like it's gonna change, right? It looks like we're no longer gonna be able to, to follow New York State guidance alone. We are expecting guidance coming from the New York State Department of Health. So that is something that um, that we expect to come very shortly. But what I thought I would still include this is just to show just a little situation of where we are. So right now you see the CDC indicators of transmission. Uh, we are, as most of the nation, in this high transmission zone. So when you look at the nation, it is, you know, <clears throat> that's the picture as of today. Um, when you look at New York State, this has been growing more and more red in that high transmission zone. Long Island uh, area in Manhattan, that's New York City, I should say that has been all red for some time. And of course, there we are. So what are the important components? Like I said, our emphasis on in-person learning, um, we're gonna be having all students expected to attend school. And if, of course, students are quarantined, will provide instruction. I'll explain more on that in a little bit. Uh, but I wanna emphasize that just as we always have, there are parents out there that are concerned about their child attending school in person for whatever reason, medically, uh, you know, typically, you know, a medical reason that they can't attend school. We would just ask them to communicate that with the, uh, their health office, with their principal, and we'll go through the normal process. Even pre prior to COVID, we've always worked with families um, that had medical issues attending school. 
So we will continue to do that. So I just want to add that in there. Um, as of now, face coverings are required for all individuals while indoors on school grounds and school buses. That's regardless of vaccination status. And face coverings remain optional, although encouraged, remain optional while outside. And of course, that provides opportunities uh, for our staff to, to take our student out, students outside and utilize outdoor spaces. We do uh, maintain the recommended physical distancing uh, in all environments where feasible. As I said before, our main goal is to not have students quarantine. And one way you do that is to maintain that physical distancing in addition to the mask usage. Um, like we ended the year, desk barriers are not gonna be utilized in the classrooms. We are gonna utilize them only in those areas where students are eating with their masks off, obviously, uh, less than six feet apart, just as an extra layer uh, of, of protection. Um, we maintain our ventilation and disinfection protocols. So those remain unchanged. Our contact tracing protocols remain unchanged. But our quarantine requirements have changed from last year. So I'm gonna go through that in a little bit. Um, they are reduced for mask students. And those daily emails, those health screenings, those are no longer gonna happen. And the temperature checks at the door are no longer going to be in place. Um, we, we found that those were uh, not effective in identifying students that were uh, in, in infectious or positive um, when we knew we had them in school. And um, so we, we eliminated that process. What we are doing is encouraging families to take temperatures daily, uh, monitor health systems, the same with our staff. As always, we pride ourselves on our communication. So we have all these communication channels available and we're gonna to continue to use those. We're gonna to continue to maintain that seven day positive chart so families can get an assessment of what's going on in other buildings, um, be able to see the cases district wide if there are any. Uh, I talked a little bit about face covering. So, um, you know, that, not much more to say on that. Obviously we'll continue to provide uh, those uh, face, masks to students that need them, staff that need them will provide them. Um, we are going to institute mask breaks throughout the day. Um, and that of course is something that we've, we've done last year and we'll look to continue to do in a safe manner. I talked a little bit about social distancing. So the current social distancing recommendation is three feet and we're gonna continue to maintain that. Uh, I talked about meals before and we're gonna continue the signage around the building to try to keep students safe and apart. So here's where things have developed a little bit. Um, in the past, any, just as in the past, any positive individual staff or student in the building will initiate a contact tracing investigation. Uh, and so that will be initiated. Um, the, any individual that tests positive, we look back the 48 hours prior to the infection, whether the positive test or the onset of symptoms. Uh, and we'd look to see who is in close contact with them for 15 minutes or more during that time. Difference from last year is that anybody was last year, anybody within six feet was subject to quarantine. And now with updated guidance, anybody within three foot range, any, I should say any student within a three foot range that's fully masked, those students will be subject to quarantine. So that quarantine circle for students has been reduced from six feet to three feet while fully masked. So again, an incentive there uh, to keep students safe and in school um, to pro provide for masks while indoors. Um, the exception does not apply to staff. Um, so adults still have that six foot radius. Still the 10 day quarantine. The only difference here is that vaccinated individual students or staff are exempt from quarantine and students or staff that were, have a, a uh, proven identifiable positive test within the past 90 days are also exempt from quarantine. And then uh, I'm gonna shift over to the instruction for the quarantine students, but I just wanna be clear that only those that are um, mandated under Suffolk County Department of Health quarantine will be permitted to participate in quarantine instruction. All right, so let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, we know that the uh, days of the teacher carrying around the Chromebook all day, uh, doing the impossible, what they call room and Zoom, um, it, it, those days are hopefully behind us. Uh, we're looking at working with our teachers to make sure that they're maintaining their Google Classrooms uh, and that they're providing that as a resource for, for students and their parents. Um, so that will happen. Uh, but at the K to five level, what we're looking to do is maintain 
during that short period of absence, which is, again, a 10-day quarantine, so we're looking at a maximum of eight days of class that would be missed, uh, looking at maintaining skills in the areas of reading, writing, and math. So we're providing that uh, live instruction to the students. Um, it's going to be an assigned teacher, one of our specialists, uh, that will be assigned to provide instruction uh, in those areas. And then also, in addition to that, want to maintain, of course, the connection to the classroom and the social connection. The classroom teacher will be scheduling a live Google Meet for that student to come on. So that may be during a read aloud or another portion of a lesson or whatever it might be, the teacher will be in communication with the family to make sure that those opportunities are available while under quarantine. In addition, at the six to 12 level where it's a little more complicated because the student travels from class to class, um, the classroom teacher will be in contact and work closely with that student uh, to provide the instruction. So the instruction will be a combination, uh, you know, like I said on the, on the slide here, synchronous engagement and some, you know, Google asynchronous instruction using Google Meet, I'm sorry, Google Classroom. Um, but the, you know, it depends on what might be happening in the classroom. So for example, if you're a social studies teacher and the child wants to listen along to a, a mini lesson that's going on or an activity that's going on, that might be more appropriate than let's say a science teacher who might be doing a hands-on lab activity where it might, might not make sense for the child to be sitting there watching that on a video. But um, again, the teacher will be communicating with the, with the student exactly what the needs are and exactly what the expectation is during that short-term absence. Um, as we've done in the past, we always teach proper hygiene and that's one of the elements of our success, so that will continue. We maintain our cleaning and disinfecting protocols, those high touch areas. So that, is, of course, will continue. I talked a little bit about the health screening, that uh, we're not gonna continue the daily health screening emails, but we will encourage parents to check the temperature prior to coming on the bus or being dropped off at school. Uh, of course, if they have symptoms, please do not send it to school. Um, parents and guardians, are, we're still gonna advertise that COVID alert email anytime, day or night that a child uh, tests positive, uh, you just email the information to that email address and uh, somebody will respond to you. Um, if it's during the classroom day or during the school day, obviously you would call the health office, but after hours, you can use the COVID alert email. And of course, staff will continue to monitor their health as they, as they always do. We are limiting schools to essential visitors only. So we are gonna do a temperature check at the door for those visitors, um, just as an extra layer, but we are gonna limit the visitors to only essential visitors. As we did last year, we maintain isolation areas for students or staff that test positive uh, while they receive treatment. So that will continue. Transportation will be the same where we, of course, disinfect the, the buses uh, nightly and our students uh, are required to, and staff are required to wear face masks on the bus, but we'll keep windows open to increase ventilation. Food service, as I said before, we are going for full use of our cafeterias. So uh, one thing I wanted to reassure our parents is that we will continue all of our allergy protocols uh, that were in place because I know that is a concern as a parent of a child with allergies myself. I wanna make sure those protocols are enforced. Uh, so that certainly will be the case. And, um, you know, the cleaning and disinfection that goes along with the use of the cafeterias. Facilities, we did a lot of work last year, those bottle filling stations, uh, making sure our ventilation was actively running, the filter replacement, we run the exhaust fans all day, humidity levels, all the things that are recommended to do, we made sure we did, and that will certainly continue. We're really excited about our technology program because we're continuing the one-to-one, -one, of course, on the six to 12 level, but at the K to five level, every single child will have a device assigned to them. So uh, that means that, you know, the days of the teacher having to wait to sign on a card, those days are over. Uh, but also if your child is quarantined and you need a device at home, that device can go home with the child and then be returned when they return from quarantine. So that's a, that's a, a nice uh, piece to make sure that the instruction is, is provided in an efficient manner. Of course, I wanna go back to that. Of course, we're gonna to continue to help support parents and students with our help desk, and of course, tutorial videos along the way. Um, 
as I said before, I just want to reiterate the fact that if there's any concerns with your child, please just contact your child's principal. All of our administrators are in. You can contact them um, and communicate any concerns that you might have. We do provide, pride ourselves on our relationships, and we just want to make sure we're supporting you in your return to school. Um, I have to update this one, but we release schedules and, and all is good. All right, so here's where the updates are, and I wanted to end here on a little bit of a positive note, which is if I compare to 2020 to 2021, um, that first piece did change a little bit because it seems um, when the state, as I said before, had informed us that they would be encouraging schools to follow CDC guidance, now it appears that we'll be receiving New York State Department of Health guidance. So I did wanna provide that update. Um, right now, we are looking at K-12 full in person, but with regard to masks indoors, uh, what we're putting in the plan is in accordance with New York State Department of Health regulations as we're expecting to get that guidance shortly. And obviously if things change, we would communicate that to, to our community. Um, outdoors encouraged but not required. Whereas last year they were required most of the year outdoors, now they're not. So we talk about mask breaks. Our teachers are very good at using outdoor spaces and providing those mask breaks to our students. Uh, athletics, of course. So we'll continue to do that. Um, the quarantine circle was reduced. I think that's a great positive for the community. Um, plastic barriers are not gonna be used. Our athletics, I'm so excited. We'll have full seasons with spectators. So we're excited about that as well. Um, the music, we went from 12 feet distancing down to six. So we're looking at uh, being able to run our full music programs. Um, lockers, we're gonna be able to use those lockers, use our cafeterias. And again, school events, wherever feasible, we'll be looking to run those in person. And I have to thank our principals for doing everything they can to make sure that that happens. So that's, um, that's our reopening plan as it exists right now at the moment. And uh, I'll turn it over to the board for questions. Does anyone on the board have um, any question or comment about the plan? Chris? <laughs> Roy, just the, um, so I think on one of the slides you said, in terms of quarantining, if your student's fully vaccinated, they do not need to quarantine. Correct. If they're exposed, they do not need to quarantine. If the vaccinated individual becomes positive, of course, they would have to quarantine. Right. But if they're exposed, the vaccinated individuals do not need to quarantine. They're encouraged to monitor their symptoms. Um, so we would, and I should have included that in the presentation, we would be sure to notify parents or guardians if children are exposed, even if they are vaccinated. We're still notified. Mm -hmm. They're in that safe category. And then the other point there is interesting, the, the proof of a positive test in the last 90 days, I assume that's, um, that's kind of an interesting development too, right? The, if, if you're recently positive, the assumption is you have antibodies and you're not right. gonna get re, uh, you're not gonna get sick again that quickly. Right. right. So, okay. Roy, you said positive test, is that, is that PCR or negative? Sorry. Um, yeah, you could turn your mic on again, sorry. I apologize. The question I had was that, with respect to the positive test, does that have to be PCR-based test or is it um, rapids are accepted? Rapids are accepted, any positive test results. Thank you um, for all those extensive um, presentations. Right now, we're going to move into our first um, public participation portion of our meeting. Um, at this moment, I have six people who have um, registered um, to be part of our public participation. So I just wanted to give um, one more opportunity for any community resident that would like to speak for public participation. You need to um, please um, fill out the form and hand it to our district clerk right now. Um, just a couple of things about our public participation, um, especially for anyone that has not been part of uh, a board meeting before. So um, 
a board of education meeting is purpose is for the board to do um, their business. It is not um, a community forum. It is um, here for us to hear the presentations from our administration um, and then respond accordingly. Um, where we don't take um, action on the spot. So I, I think it's really important for the community to have um, reasonable expectations of what the outcome of when you come to the microphone is. And most specifically, um, we empower Dr. Manning to carry out the work of the district. So um, when you're speaking to the board, of course, we are 100% listening, but ultimately we are going to charge our administration with carrying out um, his responsibilities and instructions. And we are very blessed in our community, and I know I can say that doesn't happen in other districts, that we have a very responsive administrative team. Dr. Manning is here till crazy hours. He will pick up the phone, he will call you back, he'll even call you back um, on a weekend. So rest assured that um, if you are hearing from Dr. Manning, um, that is with the blessing of the board. And when you um, send an email to the Board of Education, I also wanna reassure you that the Board of Education does read all of the emails. We have received, um, we have received emails from um, community members regarding our reopening plan, regarding, um, regarding our, um, you know, the masking for people that are speaking um, about masking on both sides of the issue. So again, I just want to um, reassure everyone that we are um, hearing your questions, we are hearing your concerns, and when you hear back from Dr. Manning, that is the Board of Education um, responding to you. When you come to the um, microphone, we have as part of our policy that we have approximately three minutes. Um, we have approximately three minutes. Um, and again, I wanna reiterate that our community participation is only for district residents. Anyone from outside of the district um, can choose to send an email to Harbor Fields, but you may not come to the microphone and speak. You can't come to the microphone and speak on behalf of a district resident. So um, I ask for everyone to be respectful of what our policies are. We don't have a formal timer or buzzing system here in Harbor Fields. We try to be friendly and respectful to each other. Um, if I do, if, if you get um, beyond three, four minutes and I cut you off, please don't take it personally. It's my job as the president to be the facilitator. Cutting people off is actually the very worst responsibility that um, I have. I don't do that with you know, pleasure at all. So um, we are a great community here. We're very respectful. I ask for everyone in the, in the audience to be respectful of each other's comments, whatever those comments are. We respect the right for everyone to have their own individual um, opinion. So with that, there are six people who um, are here as I believe community members that we did get one that is not from our community and they will not be permitted to speak. But if um, so the, I will, someone can come to the microphone who is signed in as part of our community and I'll just um, confirm your address when you come to the microphone when you say your name. Thank you. Or do you want me to just call someone up? Mm -hmm. Okay, I can call someone. Um, the, Melissa, would Melissa like to come to the microphone? And Melissa, if you would just mind, um, we don't have on record here your address. Thank you. Can anybody hear me? Well, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I feel so many things. I, I don't even, <laughs> we've talked before. I, I don't even know where to start, but I guess I'll try to keep it. Um, obviously, I know that there's, there's things that come down from the state that, that we may now have no choice in, but I feel very important for me to say how I feel um, because it looks to me, you know, I look at this, this map of this, you know, spreading, and it's like, does it ever end? I mean, when did we track, we never tracked the spreading of anything else ever. We didn't wear masks for flu. I mean, there's, there's just never, there seems to be no end to this. And I think that there has to be some thought to that, that, that we have natural immune systems that have worked for humans for thousands of years, and the immune system has to be allowed to work. And I just want to 
I, I feel it's important for parents and students to have choice. I really believe that very strongly. If you feel better wearing it, fine, but there are a lot of studies that show negative attributes to, to children and people in general, adults wearing masks, than there are that say that they do anything good as far as stopping spread. As a matter of fact, I came with a whole bunch of studies. I have a whole bunch I'd happy, be happy to email you because I know that I have very little time. Um, there's a lot of data that actually shows that they cannot show that they actually have any impact in stopping the spread. A lot of that is because this, they never study separate from all the other mitigating factors that they, you know, they put all the mitigating factors together and they say it makes a big difference, but they never separate any of them. So I think that there was one study I read that said better ventilation is helping and there's a lot of other things. So I just wanted to reiterate that, you know, this policy that is, is eliminating our kids' freedom, their ability to see faces and interact with each other is, you know, it, it's gonna impact them for years and years to come. And it's not based on any specific evidence or data or science for that matter. They keep saying science, but I haven't seen it. Um, COVID-19 is very low risk to kids. We know that they have a survival rate of 99.97. And many more of them die of the flu than uh, of this. And we, of course, we don't want any to, but that is part of life we, we know for, for everyone. Um, and there has been no data to show or little to no data to show that there's been spread from students to teachers or students within the school at any significant um, amount. Um, and the last, I, I think it's important to say that masking kids um, you know, it, it, it makes the kids think that the air is toxic. When they see masks on everybody, it, it, it shows them that they're supposed to be afraid, uh, that sickness is all around them, that it, it reinstills fear and anxiety constantly, uncertainty, everything they see, every commercial, every moment, this is all they live. It's not healthy. It's not healthy for any of us. They cannot connect with others. They can't read facial expressions, smiles, all these good things that that they should be learning, especially now when they're growing at this very pivotal time in their lives. Instead, masks cause them to breathe in their own CO2, sweat, spit, mucus, and the warmth creates a breeding ground for bacteria. And we know that bacterial pneumonia is a big problem. It actually was a problem. I think the last time they ever masked people was like the Spanish flu in 1918. And they actually went back and looked at all those the majority of the patients actually died of bacterial pneumonia. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was partially due to that. Um, last, I want to end with, um, I just want to cite one study, because I, <laughs> I could cite a lot. But this group of parents, I thought that was interesting. There's a group of parents in Gainesville, Florida. You might have read about this. They collected a face. They wanted to see about the impact of face masks. So they collected uh, I think five or six face masks. They were newly laundered, fresh face masks, and they um, sent them to the University of Florida Mass Spectrometry Research and Education Center for analysis after the children wore them for between five and eight hours. And um, they, the kids, um, they were children age six through 11, and one was worn by an adult, and they had, you know, they did a t-shirt worn by one of the children at school, um, and unworn masks tested as controls where no pathogens were found. But on the masks that they sent into the lab, they found 11 alarmingly dangerous pathogens in the mass, including streptococcus pneumonia, tuberculosis, tuberculosis meningitis, uh, I mean, half these things I can't even pronounce, anacameba polyphagia. Um, Melissa, if you would like to share, you can e um, email us or I will or email, I'm happy to email yes. to you. But anyway, the, the point of the story is, is that, you know, half the masks were contaminated with one or more strains of pneumonia causing bacteria. One third were contaminated with one or more strains of meningitis causing bacteria. It, it's just, it's not, it's not a healthy thing. They need to breathe air. So I'm just asking you if, if we have the choice, please let the parents choose for their students. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. Next, oh, okay. um, what is your name? Dave Balasheri. 29 Little Nick Road. Thank you. Center Port. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, cut, I cut this back because I, I didn't know how this worked, and, and we got the news today, so I even shaved it and moved things around. So I, I also, I'd like to thank Dr. Manning and the faculty and the staff at Harvard Fields because I think they've done a terrific job. I'd also want to congratulate the other Long Island districts that show that they actually care 
what the parents had to say, and what parents thought would be best for their children. Some districts tried to take ma uh, make masks optional, and some decided that kids could lower their masks while at their desks, which I think is reasonable. Even though our new unelected governor decided to ignore the signs today, at least those dis districts tried to do the right thing, more than I can say for hours. Last summer, we received multiple surveys and questionnaires regarding school openings. This year, we got nothing. Statistically, this virus is nowhere near as dangerous as it was when it first arrived. Until a few hours ago, New York State decided that it would be left up to the district itself. So for most of the summer, I thought with my wife, we'd be getting these surveys. Why didn't we get them? What, you know, what happened to that? Why didn't this board take into account the parents and what the parents think is best for their children? I cannot understand it. It should bother, irritate, and anger everyone in this community, everyone that has a child in this school. Whether you are for or against masks, you should be as upset as I am. This board, under their own guidelines, states, and I quote, maintains awareness of community values, concerns, and interests. This was totally ignored. I, I truly hope all the parents that are here tonight, whether you applaud what the interim governor announced today or believe like I do that cotton masks do absolutely nothing based on statistics, realize that this board has failed in a big, big way. They totally ignored the community. They totally disrespected the parents in this district. And why? So a friend pointed out to me, social media, and said to take a look at this board member's page. Besides nonstop fear mongering, articles but, and opinion pieces. Excuse me, David, the one thing I do want to point out is we will not engage into conversations about any individuals in this community. That's part of that's part of our policies. That is part of the policies, whether it is a board member, a teacher, a student, we do not talk about any individuals. If you have an issue about any individual, you need to email the board. I did. Okay. Here are a few quotes from the board member. Um, excuse me, again, we're not gonna talk about individual board members here. We are a collective board of seven. We are not here to talk about any individual board member. So I cannot permit this line of conversation to go on. If you wanna skip to lower in your, in your presentation to talk about the board in general, you are welcome to do that. Okay, let me put it this way then. We have board members on social media that are pushing their own agenda, okay? And to me, in my opinion, it is clear fear mongering. Statistically, this variant is not as deadly as last year, and it was never deadly for children. Okay? And as far as, like, let's leave it to the health experts, well, I just want to ask are these the same health experts that failed from the beginning? Okay? I know this. I, I stopped commuting. <laughs> I stopped commuting February of 2020, okay? I listened to certain people I respect, professionals, experts, and I started getting nervous, okay? These, these public health experts that we have today running, whatever they're running, they didn't prepare the hospitals last year. They did nothing, all right? So when we talk about public health experts, let's just keep it to where maybe not everybody knows what the heck they're talking about. I feel, okay, that we have board members that are pushing their own opinion through social media and I think, and they are totally ignoring the community. I think that's a fact, okay? And I think this district has set, this board has set a very bad precedent, okay? Because they ignored us this summer and we had no voice and every single parent, no matter what side you're on, whether you're for masks or no masks, vaccines or no vaccines, you deserve to be heard. You deserve to be questioned by this school district, which I moved to on purpose because of the ratings of Harborfield, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Charlotte Mangelo. Um, I am going into sixth grade and I 
am not eligible to be vaccinated yet, and I am fine with ma wearing a mask until I am eligible to be vaccinated, if it will help protect my community and others around me that are also unvaccinated or even vaccinated that are not um, I'm willing to wear a mask uh, in order to help protect my community and for the rest of the school year until the government and the rest Thank you, Charlotte, for speaking up. I know it's very hard for anyone to do public speaking, so it was very brave of you. Um, do you want me just to, to keep calling people from the list or does someone else want to just? Okay, um, well, that's what I mean. Um, all right, R Ryan. Uh, my name is Ryan Shea. Can you hear? Yes. I'm a rising senior at, at Harbor Fields. Um, obviously, we've all faced challenges for the past year and a half on this. Um, no generation of humanity has had to face anything like this in a long time, uh, and it's wreaked havoc in everyone's lives. Um, we've all faced challenges during it, but besides the fact that we should have never been faced with this challenge to begin with, um, the leadership that's been taken through this pandemic has been shameful. We as a country turned a public health emergency of a greater scale than any of us have ever seen in our lifetime and turned it into a political charade. Uh, there was a lockdown that killed small businesses and now it's the, we're politicizing medicine. There's vaccine hesitancy shaming, mask hesitancy shaming. I've never seen such poor leadership in a crucial moment like this. And that goes all the way from Washington to Harbor Fields. Uh, last year, an entire year of proper education was taken away from us. We'll never get that year back and we'll live the rest of our lives with one year less year of effective education than every other generation. That's gonna make a difference. Uh, but it's time to move on. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to. Uh, however, a lot of people haven't seemed to embrace that idea yet. Um, the announcement today by Kathy Hochul that students are mandated to wear masks, and I, this isn't official yet, but she said it, so which means it probably will become official. Uh, it's just another example of the plunge that New York State has taken into social control and medical tyranny. The arguments made in support of in-school masking are missing a few key things, namely evidence, data, science, based human decency, and most importantly, common sense. Um, there have been no facts provided. Rather, it's a persuasive, fear-mongering, propagandized case with the primary goal of scaring people into compliance. A few basic facts regarding COVID-19 and children. COVID-19 poses almost no risk to children. 4.2 million have tested positive for COVID. A total of 0.008% of them have died. According to the CDC, 477 children died from the flu in the 18-19 season, more than have died from COVID in a year and a half. I don't recall anyone on this board, anyone in town, anyone in Washington, suggest that kids wear masks in school for the flu, which again is more, bit more dangerous to them than COVID, that's a fact. Um, obviously, there's massive psychological damage, um, teaching, teaching kids that everyone around them is sick and they have to be scared. Uh, what does that do to a little kid? You have to just think about that. Um, it's it's a, uh, where am I? Uh, learning to read, and they can't, you, you can't see the mouth moving when you're learning to read. That's obviously going to affect how you learn to read. Um, or speech therapy, while the student and the teacher are, are half their face is covered. That's not effective. Uh, and while this won't directly affect someone of my age, it will for the next person, and 10, 12 years down the road, the next senior who is going to stand up here and, and you know, speak, in, speak out for what they think is important. Um, developing immune system, if they have to wear a mask every day, common sense would tell you that preventing development of the immune system, it'll cause the child to, become, to be more vulnerable to more common diseases in the future. Now, this isn't just a problem at the administrative level of New York State. One of our own board members has a severe conflict of interest. Won't go into the details because we all know them. Um, how does the board reasonably expect to 
uh, to rationalize a, an opposing viewpoint if one of their own has already penetrated any objectivity uh, by throwing their own politicized biased views into everyone else. It's not reasonably expected. Um, medical freedom is a right that everyone, every American has and should have, and it should scare everyone that there's people out there who want to take that away from you. Uh, when it comes to masks, groups like this board and Kathy Hochul are satisfied to place the burden on us, the kids. But why? It's not to keep us safe. We are safe. This is not a dangerous virus to us. And it's not to keep the adults safe. Now it sounds like every, every district-employed adult will be forcibly vaccinated or tested weekly. You do it because it makes you feel good about yourself, just as any other virtue signal does. And it serves to politically protect yourselves. Um, our masks serve as a symbolic security blanket for you, not us. You're making us suffer because of your selfish desires and to cover your behind. And the last time I checked, we didn't do anything to deserve that. I'm tired of it and I'm over it. I'm almost done. Over the last year and a half, I've become a much more depressed and unhappy person, and it's because of the embarrassing display of leadership led by the policymakers who have used this pandemic to give themselves unwarranted power. All I want is to get back to normal, and there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to. It's a disgrace, and everyone should be ashamed that it's even come to this point. It's embarrassing. You as leaders, along with many elected office holders throughout the country, have failed miserably. And my goal here, as you can probably tell, isn't to make friends or make every single one of you like me. In all honesty, my issues don't fully lie with this school board because as of earlier today, administrative levels in New York have spoken out over the individual school districts. Um, so it's not all you. But um, uh, th this is more of a release of frustration with every, every single person who's used this pandemic. And it's perfectly reasonable to say that people have used this pandemic as a political weapon. Um, my goal is to express my feeling of what's right for all the people who don't have the courage to do so for themselves. And I know they're out there. They're just scared to speak out. Um, we've complied with every one of your requests for the last 18 months. We, we, we complied because we wanted it to end. But now I realize because we complied that it's never going to end. Uh, we can't Society can't function properly if the fear of a virus with a 99.997% survival rate looms larger than all concerns. Not to dismiss the 0.003% of people who didn't survive, but we don't lower the speed limit on the highway to 10 miles an hour just because one person was killed in an accident. Lowering the speed limit would prevent more fatalities, but it's not realistic. We have to be realistic. Um, in a recent meeting with Dr. Manning, he said he doesn't want Ryan, to I, I, can I ask you, I've given you like double the right, three right, minutes, so, minute. okay, thank you. Dr. Manning said he doesn't want Harbor Fields to end up on the front page of the paper because we're the one, we, because he doesn't want us to be the one who, who did something different. Um, but maybe that would be the best possible outcome. Whoever said that Harbor Fields is supposed to stay in line and never stand up against anything. I understand that a lot of people feel liable in those types of situations, but I can tell you personally, I'll never be interested in any school, team, or individual who is never willing to step out of line. Kathy Hochul, doesn't have the legal power to mandate anything right now. And if we can put, continue to blindly comply this year, what's going to happen years down the road? It's never going to end. It's scary to think about. Um, I'm willing to be one to, st to speak out about this. I'm not going to be the most popular guy here, clearly. But soon enough, people are going to catch on. And soon enough, people like you are going to be the outcasts. Let it be known that I'm a free American who will make my own medical decisions. I will not stand down to anyone who tries to force me otherwise. And I'll never shame anyone for doing the same. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Hi. Hi, my name is Jenny Zuffner. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, my name is Jenny Zuffner. I uh, live at 112 Adam Street. I have three children. Uh, one has um, graduated. One is opting to homeschool and one is still in the district. I'm also a pediatric nurse practitioner. I've been working with children for over 25 years. 
I've been invited to Board of Ed meetings across Long Island since the spring, and I've spoken at many of them um, as I've been invited by my patients in regard to the masks. I can tell you that <laughs> It is so incredibly depressing to hear um, Governor Hockle speak. Um, as Ryan stated, she does not have the legal authority, but we all know that that probably won't matter here. Um, this issue of masks, of not having the choice, is literally dividing families. It is dividing communities, districts, states. The country, I would say, is divided here. You know, we're just at war, really, with each other on an issue that should just be a parent's choice. Um, you know, part of the reason for a lot of this is that there's there's controversy in medicine. There's there's controversy. One person can read, you know, a statistic and and say it this way, and another person can say it another way. Um, there's controversy in our community. Um, there was recently an op-ed piece put out that stated um, COVID had already um, put um, up by a, Jenny. I'm, I'm we, we're not going to be quoting. I'm quoting an op-ed piece that was put out in a but public. Are you, are you quoting an individual? I'm not quoting an individual. I'm quoting an op-ed piece that was in a, okay. a Huntington publication that okay. anybody has access to. Okay, and it stated that COVID had already killed over four times more, four times more children, four times more children than during a typical flu season. Again, COVID had already killed over four times more children during a typical flu season was the first sentence in this op-ed piece. There were references, references in this op-ed piece that could easily be searched and looked over. The data was from the American Academy of Pediatrics. So one person's experience of that data was that four times as many children have been killed from COVID than the flu. Another person's interpretation could read more like this, that the American Academy of Pediatrics stated that during the flu season, which is, as medical providers would know, is from fall to spring, so not a full year, and the pediatric deaths from the flu during the 2019-2020 the flu season were 199. The cumulative deaths, pediatric deaths from COVID to date, that's from May 2020 to current, is 371. So that is not four times more. But that is one, one person's interpretation of the same data, two different medical providers looking at the same data. This is controversy in our community and in our state. There's controversy between the CDC, who makes one statement in October of 2020, and a different statement in you know, July of 2021. So this is a problem. And when there's controversy, there needs to be choice. I can tell you that the American Academy of Pediatrics has stated that children are not super spreaders of coronavirus, but someone else will read data to the contrary. I can continue to tell you that there's volumes that I've shared with you, volumes and volumes of data stating that masks do not protect us from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, again, another medical provider would provide you with evidence to the contrary. When there, is when there is controversy like this in our community, in our state, and in our country, there must be choice. I know that we will probably end up masked because Harborfield is part of New York State here, but as a collective, as a state, as a human being, we need to fight for our children who should not be protecting those around them. We need to be protecting our children. As the people have said before me, children are going to go on to have repercussions from this. I have seen more children in my practice have adverse events from wearing a mask, whether it's physical or mental. Ryan just stated depression, anxiety is so high. Then I have seen patients with symptoms of COVID. Okay, that is significant. And I just wanted to share that, all that information with you, take it for whatever it can be. But I think as a, as a nation, as a community, we need to be fighting for our children, period. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. For those who, who do not know me, my name is Holly Wollman. Um, I have a daughter that's in um, Old Fields Middle School, and she's going into eighth grade. Um, thank you for, for your uh, gracious, gracious invitation to speak tonight. Um, I note for those that don't know that I'm also an attorney that specializes in litigation, and I've practiced law for over 25 years. So I'm looking at this from a little different perspective. I know I spoke to um, most of you on the um, June board meeting. And I, in particular, talked to you about the Locust Valley lawsuit that had occurred at that time. And since then, um, there's been multiple other lawsuits, suits, whether it's on Long Island or across the country, that are dealing with this hot topic issue at this point of mask mandates, um, mandatory vaccination. Um, we all know that this is you know, in the forefront in every school district. And I start with what I've said to Dr. Manning over and over again. I feel for all of you. I'm sorry that we're all in this position. 
regardless of your viewpoints on whether you're pro or, or against masks, um, no one wants to be in this position, and it's, an, and it's a lose-lose situation for anyone, whether it's a, on a litigation forefront, whether it's on a school mandate, whether it's on a state mandate, you're always going to have people on both sides of the, of the coin. Um, unfortunately, um, as you know, there's been, you know, uh, on top of the, the fact that there's all this litigation, the debate is being fueled by conflicting information that's been received from the governor's office. As we, as we know, first, um, when former Governor Cuomo was in office, he basically um, left it up to the schools and basically said that there is no legal authority for him to mandate um, any kind of reopening. And the, base, the premise for that was that um, his executive uh, emergency order had expired and he basically was going under that order in order to um, promulgate the regulations with respect to how schools should operate, whether there would be masks or, or no masks under an emergency guidance. Um, since then, we all know that Governor Hocko has um, indicated that under the health department, she's able to issue um, various mandates through the health department, I should say, and she's not per se doing it by executive order, but ostensibly it's gonna be the same result, and we all know that that's imminent. And with that said, it is what it is. No one could really um, do anything per se about that. Um, but with, I, I do believe, and I said this the last time, that I do think that this is gonna be the spark of a huge amount of litigation um, here in, the New, in New York, as well as in all these other states. There's rights, um, that individual rights that I talked about last time that all of us have. The constitutional rights of due process, equal protection of the law, there's various uh, statutes under the US code that um, protect people's civil rights and deprivation of their rights. And the bottom line to the mask mandate is that the, the, the way that the uh, plaintiffs in a lot of these actions are, are, are defining the mask, they're saying that they're not per se a mask, they're an emergency experimental device is what they're saying. And they've been, they're being authorized in order to, um, to effectively prevent COVID. But if that's the case and they're being authorized under federal regulations, you're also required to have something called informed consent. And I think a lot of people have probably heard that term being thrown around. Um, informed consent means ostensibly that someone has to um, be informed of their right to refuse to wear the mask legally. Um, they have to be informed of the downside to wearing the mask. They have to be informed of all of the negative repercussions that could happen from wearing that mask. And the problem that, that's going to come up and that is coming up in these cases is um, because they've never isolated the impact of these masks in comparison to all these other measures that, that they're taking in order to prevent COVID, um, it's very hard for the, the people that are proponents of masks to actually say what the positive or the negative impacts of the masks are. For example, there's no studies that I'm, I know of, and again, I'm not a doctor, but I've, I've looked at a lot of these litigations, and so thus far in these litigations, no one has been um, able to point to a study on any kind of safety data on long-term effects and efficacy of requiring children to wear masks or other facial shields while in the school day, basically over seven hours with minimal breaks. And that's, an, that's a constitutional right to know what can happen to you. It's kind of like, what happened in World War II with the Nuremberg trials. If everyone remembers, unfortunately, they were experimenting on people. And I'm, I, I don't mean to, to, to take this to that level of, obviously, what they were doing there because it was horrific. But the point is that they came up with a code that basically says that if, they, if you're going to have some sort of experiment done or some sort of device that's going to be utilized, you have to have the ability to say no. And you can't just say, and you also have to know that you can say no. And you also have to know what would be the benefit of saying no or yes? And there is nothing out there at this point that's- Oh, yeah, I'm just gonna ask you to wrap it fully up. Thank mandating you, that. thank you. Um, to compound matters, we know that the CDC um, has changed its position numerous times, and I think that's just stoking the flames at this point. Um, but I do wanna point to the fact that I have looked over, because I've asked Dr. Manning about this several times, I did look very in depth at the policy of the school board policy that's put on the website. There's and I'm happy to, to, at another time, go through all the regulations, but there's policy 2000, regulation 2110R, policy 2111, uh, policy 2170, policy 2160. Um, all of these policies talk about, um, in some and substance, um, starting with the responsibility of the board to ensure that the um, educational programs that are provided with a high level of 
of quality, but also to ensure that the actions and performance that take into account the considerations and concerns and aspirations of the community. The various other provisions talk about strong ethical standards. There's an ethical code that's, that's actually implemented that every board member has to sign and is expected to assign and, 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 and abide by that school board member code of conduct, which talks about no conflicts of interest, but talks about basically refraining from any kind of personal partisan positions, talks about doing what's right in, and for the greatest concern um, and benefit for the welfare of the students attending public schools. But there's many provisions in that code, I, and I was surprised at how many, that actually talked about conflicts of interest and talked about the fact that people need to put aside any kind of personal opinions. And Holly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, ask you, besides being over on time, if you have a concern about um, any of the policies or-, or No, a, I don't have a concern, okay. I actually like them. Okay. I'm actually saying good job whoever okay. drafted but, those. I'm just saying that in taking into consideration all those policies that, and we should be taking those policies into consideration, when you're making a determination as to what to do, um, you need to look at those policies. They're good policies, actually, who I commend whoever drafted them. And as I said, I was surprised that there's, it's so elaborate on what a conflict of interest is and what is supposed to be in the best interest of the students or the welfare of the, of the, the child. And basically, the most important thing is the, the educational welfare of a student. And it goes beyond just education, health and welfare. So I actually think that's an excellent policy. And I, whoever, if you, this board, took part in it, I don't know, but I commend whoever drafted that. But that, those rules, beyond all the rules that I talked to you about, whether it's constitutional rights, I ask that the board consider the policies and the rules that, that it is mandated by when making a determination as to what is in the best interest of the students and, and what choices they have on whether to wear a mask, not wear a mask, um, any kind of requirements that are being imposed upon them that are inconsistent with the policies that are set forth in the, the school's own procedures. I would ask that you look at that when making your evaluation. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Okay, there's, um, there's, a, there's, just a couple, there's just a couple more and then we are gonna have to move on to our actual uh, business part of the meeting. Um, does anyone else um, who has registered already wish to come up at, at this time? And I would also ask um, if anyone has anything different to say, because there's also going to also become a point. Um, we, we're receiving the same message over and over, and we reserve the right to say that we need to move on to the rest of the meeting. So are you registered on here? Hi. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Marie Chacon. I live on uh, Southern Oakwood Street, everyone. Hi. So, is that better? Yes. Sorry, even adults get a little nervous in front of the podium. Um, I, I'm going to keep this short and sweet because a lot of people have, um, I'm just going to reiterate the sentiments that they had said about wearing masks. Um, I just want to say there was one statistic that really came to heart. Um, the CDC had reported that 355 children had died of COVID. Children, that's what we're talking about children here. I mean, there's all of the world around us, parents, there's a, a ton of it, but we're talking about our children. Um, Within that same time frame, I think uh, it ended in July of 2021, so 18 months when COVID started. Within that same time frame, there were about 49,000 children that died in the United States, and this is a national number. So with that statistic, we're talking about 0.67% of children who had died in the U.S. died of COVID. So again, my perspective is that this is not affecting our children. And I feel like that they are taking the brunt of what our fear is as parents um, and having to live in this environment wearing masks at school. Again, this is masks, I'm not gonna get into it. I kind of want to support the parents here and a lot of what they said, I've read studies, I understand what they're talking about. It's the same, it's the same. So I will keep this short and sweet. I agree that parents should have choice um, we all know what's best for our children and our family. Um, if others perceive it as a risk, well, let us take that risk. Um, very shortly, I lived with an immunocompromised father for prior to COVID. He had leukemia, leukemia and he died of, of leukemia, not of COVID. So I know what it's like to be around someone um, who was immunocompromised. And yes, they need to be protected goes out to that girl who came here and said that she feels that needs, she needs to be protected, but yet this Dr. B 
a way to protect the immunocompromised and also understand that our children don't need to wear masks all day and have all these other anxiety issues because of the world that we live in. So I'll keep that short and sweet and thank you to the parents that. Thank you, thank you. wait, wait, um, excuse me. No, but, uh, uh, you know what, I, but, uh, there are other people that were, that were waiting oh, okay. um, in, in, in front of you and I am, I am in five minutes going to push all the rest of the comments off until after the rest of, of the agenda because our, our policy actually dictates only a half hour of public participation and we are going um, well over that. So thank you and I appreciate everyone's uh, respect to that. Hi everyone, my name is Kim Bykov. I'm a parent of a TJL student. Um, I want to thank the board, Dr. Manning and his staff, um, of course, for working through this very difficult time. I wanna thank you for continuing to adapt to a disease that unfortunately um, has continued to change over the last 18 months. Um, thank you very much for following the recommendations of the CDC, um, as well as various New York State departments. Um, for keeping the goal in mind, keeping our schools open and to permit all students to be able to attend in person. Thank you so much for implementing mitigation measures, measures including wearing masks that are gonna prohibit us to do, or enable us to do that. So, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, the other two people I did have from before are Lori and Lisa. Hi, Lori. Hi, everybody, I'm Lori, can you hear me? So I have two children in the district. I've come here as a parent who worries out about my children's health. Unfortunately, we've had many health issues with my two children, one in particular. We have to be very careful what we do with my child. That being said, I'm asking you to help me. You are my voice. You're my children's voice. And when we look at my children and the past two years that I've dealt with their, their medical conditions, countless hours, money, sleepless nights, and then I'm going to be taking my medical freedom away, that's a big problem for me. If my daughter were to receive the shot, I don't know what would happen. She has neuroinflammation, that's brain inflammation. It doesn't happen all the time, but it happens. I don't know the ramifications of what this shot would do to her. And me and the medical team that we work with have decided that this is not appropriate at this time. We are still healing. So if someone were to tell me that I'm mandated to give this to my child, I don't know what would happen. It's scary. And if this child were to get this virus, the success rate, we all know, is 99.97% that she's gonna be just fine. We have no long-term studies, none. I have no idea what's gonna happen in five years from now. We already deal with autoimmunity. We know that part of these vaccinations and this particular shot, we're more likely to develop an autoimmune condition and even more so with someone who already has one. Now, I know you can't make these decisions in the governmental level and all that stuff, but we need voices to protect my child. And everybody's so worried about all the things in this virus and hurting all the other people. What about this person? What about that person? Well, what about my kid? It's not fair to put me in this situation to make this decision. I have made so many medical decisions for this person every single day. And when someone's going to take that away from me, it's really scary and I don't like it. And I'm gonna fight, I'm trying to fight, but it's really feeling very, very difficult. So what I'm asking of you guys is sit there and support me and the other people in this room or in our community to fight for us and stand up for Harbor Fields. And if someone else mentioned, if there's conflict or, con or what's the word? 
Thank you. Controversy. We need to have decisions that I can make for myself. We can't be a one size fits all. That's not medicine. So I'm really hoping that we can keep our freedoms. The last I checked, we live in America, okay? We should be free to make our medical decisions based on what is appropriate at this time. And at this time, I don't want the mandates. It's not helpful for me, my kids, and their future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last person, uh, is Lisa here? I'm going to keep this short and sweet, but I agree with what everybody here had to say tonight, that the mask mandate should be a choice. This is our freedom. This is our children. I have a child in the school district with special needs. He has a rare syndrome, which he happens to have a large speech and language deficit. And by wearing a mask, it has greatly decreased. He has been in your schools all summer with your principals, with your teachers, without a mask on, having the best time, regaining his speech, learning how to read again, all without a mask. There has not been one COVID outbreak. I have sent you statistics the other day regarding children with having COVID, and it is extremely low. My family, we all had COVID. My son, Aiden, was born at 32 weeks, weighing two and a half pounds, growing up with pneumonia and other difficulties. He had a headache for approximately five hours, where I, a very healthy individual, was very sick. He was running around fine. My 14-year-old daughter was sick with a cold. These kids do not get sick very badly with this. To put them in a mask, to, as I like to put it, a muzzle where my kid cannot speak, he cannot read, he cannot communicate how he is feeling if it is uncomfortable for him, if he can't breathe, is detrimental to his health and well-being. My 14-year-old daughter is now in therapy due to anxiety of having to wear a mask. She has said to me, Mom, out of everybody, the kids have had this the worst. At this point, Grandma can get a vax. Everybody can get a vaccine. Why are these children still in masks? I'm asking you, make it a choice. Fight for us. If this governor, she has not, she does not have executive powers. And until she does have executive powers, she cannot mandate masks. Fight for us. I know I have sent emails asking for Harvard Fields to fight. And like this gentleman said, where was our survey? We had a survey about coming back to school full time. We had a survey about masks. We had a survey about shields. Where was our survey about the masks? My kid, not yours. You do not tell my kid what to do. The government will not tell my child what to do. I tell my child what to do. We like this, somebody else said, we live in America, the last I remember. We have freedoms, just make it a choice. You wanna wear a mask? Awesome. You don't, great. Let these kids go back to being kids. They have had the most detrimental year and a half of their lives that they will never get back. My daughter will never get the last year and a half of her education back. My son will never get the last year and a half of his education back. My daughter's terrified to start high school because she learned Jack last year. And all of you sitting up here with masks, you all sound like Charlie Brown's teachers, so I do not understand how these kids are sitting in a classroom learning while Charlie Brown's teachers are in the front of the class trying to teach to them. That is it. Just make it a choice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and there's, all right, there's, there's one, la Helen. Is the, is the last one and that ends our public participation. I'll make this really quick. I just need 10 seconds. Um, I'd like to thank the school board um, and Dr. Manning. I'd also like to thank, thank um, you know, people, people who spoke up today. It's important to give people that opportunity 
I'd like to focus on what unites us and not what divides us. We all love our kids. We all want this pandemic to be over. It is a terrible, terrible thing that I would not wish on any other generation. I also believe that of course accommodation should be made for anyone who is immunocompromised, has an autoimmune disorder or who has special needs. And I believe the district will do that. I believe that is part of your plan and Dr. Manning is nodding. Um, so all that said, I want us to remember what is going on in Southern states in Texas and Mississippi and Florida and other places. And I just wanna remind everyone that pediatric ICUs there are filling up and we need to do everything we can to stop that. Thank you. I would just like to thank everybody for their public participation. And I, I genuinely appreciate the respect that everyone had for each other here um, today. So I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, Dr. Manning. Um, if, I, if I could respond to just a couple of issues that were uh, brought up, uh, just to make sure that and I'm communicating clearly, you know, we pride ourselves on our communication and, you know, it, it's, um, <clears throat> it, it hurts to hear that about uh, whether or not we take value in what our community feels, because of course we do. I think we've demonstrated that over time. Uh, as indicated, we've, we've sent out a lot of surveys and a lot of different things. And I think one thing is very clear that we received a ton of communication regarding people's opinions on all aspects of masking or vaccines or, or whatever it might be. And one thing is very clear, and I've said it before, I don't think anybody would dispute it. Um, and as the last uh, speaker shared, you know, none of us want to be in the positions that we're in. And um, confident, quite confident that what we sent out in a uh, survey regarding masks, uh, generally just asking if anybody wanted to wear a mask, I don't think anybody would respond that they wanted to. Uh, at the same time, sometimes when you provide surveys and give the, the false impression that um, the popular opinion would necessarily dictate what we can and can't do, uh, that, would, that would be unfortunate. I would never want to communicate or falsely communicate that we could respond to popular opinion um, in, a, in a decision such as what we're facing with a reopening plan. So I just wanted to respond to that and, and I understand uh, people's opinions and thoughts. I just wanna make sure that the general understanding is that we do appreciate and value input in, in all processes that we, uh, that, we, uh, that we obviously face. On the other uh, note with regard to vaccinations, um, you heard statements that were made by our incoming governor with regard to vaccinations. Time will tell what the process is there, but just to be clear that vaccinations uh, are something that is determined by the state of New York. Uh, so that remains to be seen the direction that, that goes there, but um, I just wanted to make that point uh, regarding that, uh, just in case there was confusion that vaccinations would be a district level decision. So um, I think that's it. All right, but again, as Ms. Lustig said, thank you all for your participation. With that, we move on to our business meeting. The first item is the Board of Education minutes. Are there any um, corrections or additions to the minutes? With that, we move on to our finance portion of our meeting. Item 4.1, Treasurer's Report. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 4.2, Schedule of Bills. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 4.3, financial status report. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 4.4, claim auditor's report. Aye. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 4.5, private school placement special education services contract. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 4.6, private school placement special education services contract. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 4.7, Special Education Services Contract. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 4.8, Home Tutoring Contracts. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 4.9, E-Rate Rebate and Increase in Appropriations. 
Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 4.10, acceptance of gifts, grants, and increase in appropriations. Any discussion? Thank you for, to Stop and Shop for continually supporting our schools. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 4.11, surplus materials. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 4.12, bu budgetary transfer of funds. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 4.13, approval of request for defense and indemn indemnification. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Item uh, moving on to human resources, item 5.1, resignations. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.2, uh, abolishment of civil service positions. Aye. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.3, creation of civil service position. Aye. Any discussion? All in favor? Item 5.4, termination of employment. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.5, revision of leave of absence. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.6, permanent substitute list for school year 2021-2022. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.7, substitute list addendum. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.8, permanent appointments. Aye. Any discussion? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.9, professional appointments. Aye. Dr. Manning. Aye. So uh, as we do every uh, every board meeting, but uh, certainly this time of year, we hire a lot of staff. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Campbell, who's been hard at work, as you see, appointing some of our, or recommending the appointment of some of our staff. Ms. Campbell? And I know um, many of them I saw here, and I know many had to leave. So if you are currently on this list, um, I just believe we have uh, Mr. Companion. Mr. Companion, come up, stand up. Give a wave, Mr. Companion. And I want to make sure I'm not missing anybody in the back there. No, we're good, okay. All right, thank you, Vincent, for staying. Oh, Mr. Martino. Hi. Welcome to all of all in favor? Aye. 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 And we want to wish um, all of our new appointees a long and happy um, and successful career in Harbor Fields. Welcome to the Harbor Fields family. Item um, 5.10, professional reappointment. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.11, professional appointment teaching assistants. Aye. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.12, civil service appointments. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.3, increase in hours. What did I say? 5.13. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.14. <laughs> any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.15, translator list. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.16, civil service change of status. Any discussion? 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.17, leave of absence. So moved. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.18, separation payments. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Item uh, moving on to the instruction portion, item 6.1, review. May I say it first? Thank you. <laughs> review of IEP recommendations and authorization for placement and services. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. So we're getting a little punchy. Item 6.2, ratification approval of reopening operation plan. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 6.3, appointment of data protection officer 2021-2022. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 6.4, overnight field trip. So moved. Second. Any discussion? We wanna wish um, everyone who's involved in the natural helpers a great retreat and much success in helping to guide your peers in the coming school year. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That concludes everything. We have um, no items for discussion. If anyone wishes to speak at the public uh, participation at this point, um, we, do, we do need you to register, but I'm going to assume that nobody else wants to talk at all. With that, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Good night, everyone. Good luck, and we'll see you in September for the start of a great school year. Bye-bye.